Welcome to the Legal Forum, provided by the San Fernando Valley Bar Association, the Legal Information and Lawyer Referral Service of the Bar Association, and this station. The goal of this program is to create a better understanding of the legal profession and the community in which it serves. This is the first of five such shows that we're going to be producing. Before we get to today's topic, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. To my left is Heather Atkinson. Heather is in private practice. She's a business, entertainment, and international law lawyer. Her offices are here in the San Fernando Valley. She's a trustee of the San Fernando Valley Bar Association and practiced formerly in Jamaica. So she brings a very interesting and important international perspective to our discussion here. To her left, Neil Dudovitz. Neil is the executive director of the San Fernando Valley Neighborhood Legal Services. They provide legal services to those who cannot afford them. Their offices are in Pacoima. To his left, Barbara Jean Penny. Barbara Jean is a family law lawyer. Her offices are in the Valley. She's the past president of the San Fernando Valley Bar Association and co-founder of the Family Law Center, which provided legal services in the family law field to middle-income individuals. And lastly, on her left, David Lawfer. David is a partner with a 45-member law firm here in Woodland Hills. He's a business attorney handling primarily business transactions and acquisitions. I'm David Hagen. I'm a bankruptcy attorney. I'm president-elect of the San Fernando Valley Bar Association, and I'll be acting as the moderator today. Well, panel, let's get down to it. The first qu question, the role of attorneys in today's society. That's the topic for today. What is the role of lawyers in today's society? I've heard people say that lawyers are simply business people. Others say that lawyers have a special or enhanced role in our society. What do you think? Heather? The primary role is to be of service to the client. However, most, most attorneys are mindful of their business and professional obligations. And this forces them to be very concerned about the client's, not just the client's case, but the client's ability to pay. I have um, served clients and had clients tell me they're very concerned when, when, an, when an attorney says they run a business. They see this as contradictory. But the reality is attorneys have to be mindful of staying in business themselves and honoring their professional obligations and other clients. But the bottom line is the buck. Is that right? I don't fully agree with that. that. Certainly for some people are interested in making money, but in fact uh, because lawyers are the key to the justice system and the justice system is where we resolve disputes in our society, um, lawyers have an additional role and obligation in that and that is to ensure that the justice system is fair and open to everyone. I think the uh role of the lawyer is to protect rights of uh, individuals and people, uh, businesses, and throughout history lawyers have been on the vanguard of protecting rights. You take the civil rights movement, you take the, the, um, the uh, improvement of uh, protection of individuals, the First Amendment, uh, right to services, we've always been on the forefront of helping people. So we are in a business, we are in a profession and we always uh, do everything we can to promote the good of society. Obviously, David, we have to make some money in order to keep our law offices open, but I think that we have to educate the people with regard to what's going on in their case. We know exactly what's going on because we do it day in and day out, but I think that to everyone else it's somewhat of a mystery and they need to understand it. Well, let's take that to its logical extension then. Mandatory pro bono. Pro bono being free time that lawyers um, contribute to the community to handle matters at no fee. Should there be mandatory pro bono as a requirement to practice law in the state of California? Absolutely not. When uh, plumbers are required to fix our leaks free, when plasters are required to plaster free, and when everyone else in society is required to do something for free, then I think we consider imposing those restrictions on lawyers. I think it's unnecessary. Lawyers vol volunteer their time. Every viewer of this program will see that lawyers serve on boards, volunteer their activities, and historically they have uh, volunteered their time and continue to do the same thing today. Well, I, I don't agree with you, Dave. Uh, first, let, let me start by saying that I do agree that lawyers volunteer their time and they're, and, and they're tremendously important and here in the Valley we wouldn't be able to provide the amount of services we do without the help of volunteer lawyers but in fact we need more help and again because as I said before lawyers are the key to the system and if you don't have access to the system uh, you can't participate in our society 
um, we owe a special obligation. Um, I realize other professions don't have that obligation. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have the obligation. It's I, actually, the number of hours that we already give as um, <coughs> we're mediators, we're judges pro tem, we do this for nothing. We're, we don't get paid for it, and we do it to help the court system move a little bit more smoothly. However, all of us do do some pro bono work, but we do it on our own, and if we were forced to do it, I'm wondering about the quality of work that you're going to get from someone who has to do mandatory pro bono. Well, I saw some figures from the Family Law Center when it was operating, and there was an estimate that it was almost a million dollars of legal time that was donated on a yearly basis to make that center run. Um, and of course, anytime anyone says a million dollars, that, that really impresses me. Um, on the other hand, with any group of people, there's going to be a number of people that um, are not going to do anything at all. And, it, and is that fair that uh, maybe half the lawyers uh, end up carrying uh, all, the, uh, all the weight for the others that don't? That isn't fair, but those that don't want to go ahead and volunteer their time, they make contributions in other ways. For example, they uh, donate money to the Legal Aid Foundation or to county bar associations or to the Valley Bar Associations. So there are other ways to be supportive of the need of all people to have access to lawyers rather than to make it a mandatory function. I don't think mandatory uh, functions work, and while I agree with Neil that we have to do more, I don't think compulsory uh, duty is the way to do it. It's an inter interesting balance because I think in serving each client, most attorneys do give uh, free service. It's impossible to bill a client for everything which you do for them. And oftentimes, whether it's in the introductory meeting or part way through the case, most attorneys, once they've established a relationship with their clients, they usually make concessions. And I think that's, a, that's one of the ways in which attorneys and clients can maintain good ongoing relationships. And that's one of the ways in which clients should evaluate the value of the service they're getting from their clients, from their attorneys, in terms of the comfort level they have in relating and the things which don't actually go on the bill, but which do in fact benefit the client. How about from a historical perspective? Has the role of lawyers changed in the last several years? I always have this this vision of Perry Mason or Spencer Tracy or maybe more in, in modern day vernacular Tom Cruise. Uh, but has the, the role of lawyers changed in the last, say, 50 years? I don't think so. We've always had lawyers that have been good lawyers, good citizens, and supportive of the community. And we've always had lawyers that are not so good. For example, there's a recent book out on Clarence Darrow, which uh, documents the fact that he bribed juries and um, paid money for witnesses to disappear. Um, we have a tendency to romanticize uh, sort of the Gregory Peck uh, to kill a mockingbird view of lawyers, but lawyers are human beings. Some are good, some are bad, some do good things, some make uh, mistakes, but I think the, the role of lawyers has historically been to, to protect rights, and we, we are human. I think the perception has changed a little bit in terms of the um, actual people who are attorneys. I think 20, 30 years ago, people thought that that was something which was unattainable. But I think with the opening up of the educational system and opportunities, there is a much more diverse uh, presence. Attorneys are no longer stereotypes. There are opportunities for just about anybody, providing they're, they're willing to commit to the time and the education to become attorneys. So I think the perception has changed. I guess I, uh, I agree with you that it's more diverse, although I think it's not as diverse as, as I would like to see it. Um, but um, I also think maybe our perceptions of the justice system and, and have, have changed some over time, and that rubs off on people's views of, of lawyers since obviously we're part, part of that system. So I, I think I agree with Dave, our role hasn't changed much, but, but in fact the system might be perceived differently by people today than it was 20, 30, or 50 years ago. What is society's fascination with trials in the legal system? You see so many movies, The, the Firm, A Few Good Men, all of these movies, and, and people flock to programs that are about trials in the legal system. Look at uh, the advent of uh, Court TV, a whole channel. There have been trials that have, have just gripped the nation, and in fact some that we've even watched live. Have you ever thought about that? What, what is society's fascination with the legal system? It's like a Greek tragedy. You have, uh, you have all yeah. the problems that we as human beings experience in a trial. 
you have grief, you have pain, you have uh, injury to third, per to third persons, you have drama in the courtroom. So it's an exciting place to be. It's, uh, it's a form of uh, resolution of problems, and at the same time, it's one of the most interesting forms to do it. And in, in its own way, it is a Greek tragedy. Just take any current very popular trial and see if it isn't a Greek tragedy. There's a protagonist, there's someone that's died, there's someone that's trying to be reborn to create, create a new identity. So we're, we're like the old Greeks. It makes for good drama, huh? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Shakespeare says, the whole world is but a stage and we're all actors on it. And so it's entertaining, it's educational, and people draw from these experiences and try to incorporate them into their lives to make them better people and learn good and bad about the system and in watching it live happen. Yeah. Are lawyers a product of our society? We've talked about um, um, how somebody comes in and they want to hire a lawyer and uh, they traditionally have not wanted to be represented by someone who we would uh, characterize as a shark. But when there's a dispute, they call the referral service and they say, get me one of those sharks. <laughs> Are we a product of society? Are we a product of um, some kind of bum rap, perhaps? Or is it something that we brought on ourselves? They don't all say, give me one of those sharks, first of all. Uh, lawyers are, you know, we're just people like anyone else. Before we went to law school, we were just the person next door. Then we become lawyers. We still have the same personalities. We still have the, the same good or the same bad in us. And the people that want someone who's really going to be a shark, they're going to look for someone that's going to give the other person a real difficult time. Someone who just wants to go out there and get their case done and over with and just wants to get it through the system, they're going to say, I'd rather settle. I want someone who wants to settle a case mm -hmm. as opposed to someone who wants to be very obstreperous in this society. So uh, we're, you know, it's the clients and the lawyers, and it seems like the bad clients seem to hook up with maybe some bad lawyers. <laughs> so you're saying that there are different types of lawyers for different types of legal jobs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I think I would agree with that, but I'm going to go back to my view that maybe people's perceptions of the justice system are part of what's at issue here, and that is I think a lot of people think that if I get the lawyer who can yell and scream the loudest, um, my case will get heard. Mm. I don't think that really is the reality of how the system works, but in fact I think it is how some people perceive, perceive it, and that's why they say, give, give, me, give, me, give me that person who's going to jump up and down and scream for me. Yeah, I think there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear of the, the, the system and a lot of ignorance. So that takes us back to the role of the attorney. The role of the attorney is to educate the client, mm -hmm. not to give them false comfort, but to allow them to understand the different issues and the different probabilities and to advocate the client's interest within the um, ambit of what the situation is. Well, but you know, I hear that it's an adversary system. And it seems to me that adversary system means use your full all out, go for it, or you know, as Al Davis of the Raiders said, to just win, baby. You know, what, what, what do you think about that? Well, federal judge Henry F Friendly talked about that very thing, David. He said that in our adversary system, and and I think lawyers must do a better job in educating their clients and uh, the public generally. Generally, it is not the lawyer's job to seek truth. It is not the lawyer's job to reach a, quote, just result. It's, it's to advocate by any ethical means, and that means delay, confusion, anything that the law and ethics permit to advance his client's cause. And I think that when clients understand that and when the system understands, or when people understand that the system works best where people from opposing points of view vigorously vigorously advocate their rights, then the judges and the juries are the ones that are looking for truth. And we have to let people know that. Our job is we're hired by someone to ethically do the best we can for them. We don't, we don't get hired to make decisions. I have to disagree. Of course, I don't do the same type of law that David does. I'm in, in family law. But in family law, what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep, we're trying to keep everything calm 
I mean, I've had people come to me and they've said to me, well, we would like you to pretend that I want custody of the children just so I don't have to pay as much support and I want you to use that. And I will tell them I can't use that and the reason for that is all we have is our reputations. And if the judges thought that I was the type of lawyer that was going to use that, then they wouldn't listen to me anymore. And so I think that we can't listen to our clients all of the time. We can tell them go find a, another attorney that might want to do that and that's what I say. You can always find lawyers that will fit the clients. But no, our, our job in the family law arena is definitely not to keep the litigation going and it's, it's sort of to put all the cards on the table and then let's settle it all and see what we can do about getting these people on with their lives. I think what, uh, what David said is, is, is probably true with regards to the attorney's role as an advocate. But I think increasingly with the burden on the legal system, there are other roles which an attorney serves, a negotiator, a, a mediator a, a in dispute resolution sometimes you have to move towards a win-win situation and, and in that type of environment being an advocate and holding out for your clients extreme position may not be the appropriate way to represent your clients best interest and I think increasingly especially for uh, transaction attorneys attorneys who do not go to court but who negotiate deals they recognize that, they, they, that, they, that they've got to have some moderation in their demands or else their ultimate result is not, just not going to be achieved. So I think we need to look at the different roles, whether it's in court, whether it's in a negotiation, whether or not your objective is to keep everybody happy or calm in a family situation, or whether or not it's to win at any cost. And that is really what's going to be the defining criteria. Well, we've all had clients who have said, um, win at any cost inflict the most amount of damage possible, make it expensive and difficult and annoying and, and a very bad experience for the other side to go to trial and get in there and fight. And what do we do in a situation like that? Here we're squaring the role as an advocate against the role as a counselor advisor. How, how do we deal with a client like that? And I'm sure we've all had clients like that from time to time who wanted to take that tack. My view is that the client should select the attorney who is going to give them the result they want. So at the outset, the client needs to know what's the out what outcome do I want? And you find an attorney who matches the outcome. It may be that in one situation, an adversarial situation, you'll have two attorneys. You'll have one who is pursuing your, the role, of, role as an advocate, the 100 pound gorilla or the 1,000 pound gorilla, and you'll have somebody on the other side who is working at the same time in a more conciliatory um, manner to close or to settle the case before it gets caught up in a two or three year dispute and escalating costs. Because if you've got an attorney who is an advocate who is giving the other side a hard time, this gets expensive. So you need to determine if you're prepared to pay for that, if that's a part of your objective, or if you want to minimize costs and you, you want to wrap the deal up or, or wrap the case up as soon as possible. I don't think you can have a general rule for all problems. For example, <coughs> I agree with um, Barbara that uh, in a domestic relations in a divorce or a custody case the lawyer's role primarily is to the family even though he may represent the husband or the wife it's clear that in that situation the lawyer has has a duty not to advocate unreasonable uh, positions by his client but let's take another uh, situation let's take a look at something that was recently televised where where people in Kettleman City or in some other uh, community are being poisoned by the water uh, that PG&E has been dumping. Uh, they've been fighting that lawsuit. The discovery has been concealed. And unless the lawyers aggressively pursue the rights of the people who have had cancer, who have died, who have had birth defects, unless they go after those people very, very vigorously, justice is not going to be done. So you've got to ask these questions in the context of the dispute. And no one is advocating that a lawyer wreak confusion or that a lawyer uh, disrupt the system. I think what's clear, though, is that you have to go ahead and realize that we're working for people and they have a right to have their position advocated. A person accused of a crime does not go to a lawyer to be told by that lawyer you're guilty. He goes to that person to defend him within the law and within the ethics. If he doesn't have the right to select that lawyer, the system doesn't work. And a lot of people are imprisoned unjustly and have been because people believe 
that prosecutors may be right and they turn out to be wrong. So you have to have a vigorous defense. I, I absolutely agree, agree with that. I think you have to differentiate between um, somebody who has a legitimate position or a legitimate goal and then all you do to get them that position versus somebody in your question whose sole goal is to be a streperous and, and uh, disrupt, disrupt the system. Um, it, it's, I don't know many lawyers who would represent someone wh whose goal is to disrupt the system, but on the other hand, if you're going to represent a client I absolutely, who has legitimate position, then I absolutely agree with, with David that, that uh, sometimes you need to do that very vigorously. Well, let's get back to this, this role then of just the advocate. Now, the system is designed at this point um, so that two individuals using all the tools at their disposal, both legally and ethically, go head to head and have this battle. And out of the middle of this ultimate battle springs the capital T truth of the trial. Now that's a system that was designed by our forefathers and mind you, they drowned, they drowned women to see if they were witches. Is that an idea whose time has come and gone or does that uh, uh, still hold a lot of credence? Well, let me just say one point that's important in that system is everybody has to be able to present their issues in court. And I think one of the things that we're seeing for lots of various reasons is everybody isn't able to equally get into court and present their issues. And so the system will not work unless uh, whether you're rich, rich or poor or whether you've got a big or a little problem, you have an ability to have your side presented, presented in court. And so I, I think that's, that is a question that Hard to, hard to know whether it's working correctly today. Well, it really is not working correctly today. One of the reasons is that we don't have trial courts <coughs> available. And so that's why we have to try to mediate more cases. That's why we have to try to settle more cases. Um, the court system, you go into court and they'll tell you, we will give you a trial if you're lucky in a year or two. And even then you'll go back and they don't have the trial courts available. So, so the days, I mean, I guess it, it works in criminal law. I don't do any criminal law, but, it, but in the, day, the days of the family law, people going head to head and the truth coming out, few and far between. The people watching this program have no problem in spending several billion dollars for bombers and missiles. But every time lawyers and judges ask our legislature for more judges, uh, more tools so that the people can get their disputes heard in a timely manner, we're, we're rebuffed. We're told, no, you have enough. And, and the system works best when people have access and it has to be timely access. The system was designed to have a person see a judge and a jury within a reasonable period of time, six months, seven months, eight months. It was not designed to have people go through a forest in paper shuffling and then five years after the fact to face a judge or a jury. And that's what's wrong with the system. And we lawyers must do a better job to get the people watching this program to get more money so that we can go ahead and more efficiently and timely solve those problems. Let's shift gears just a little bit. Talk about fees, something near and dear to every lawyer's heart. The one thing that I hear from people is that lawyers' fees are too high. There's a perception that the lawyers are the fat cats. Are lawyers' fees too high? I don't think so. Most people don't realize that uh, a part of every lawyer's fee is uh, secretarial staff, support staff, Xerox machines, faxes, um, computers. Uh, most lawyers that practice in the valley find somewhere between 60 and perhaps between 50 and 60 percent of the fees they charge go to staff support to rent, landlords, and what have you, which is good for the local economy. The balance goes to uh, the lawyers that are doing the work, and most people don't realize, but Barbara can tell you a story that, that I know happened to her, where she worked for a couple of years and then tried to get her money, and um, she was never paid. So, so she, she, in fact, not only worked pro bono, but to help out a client. She actually wrote a check so that the client wouldn't be bothered by a, an agency. Yes, it was the one and only case that I had turned over to a collection agency and I, I really didn't intend them to be calling this client of mine and they were calling my client on an ongoing basis. She begged me, please get them off my back, I'll pay you my money. I said, certainly I will. I had to pay them one third of what she owed me at the time to get them off my back and I have not received a penny yet. So 
Um, we do have it, it, we do have a lot of clients that just don't pay us. We have a lot of accounts receivable, and also we have a lot of education we have to pay for. We have our, we have our insurance that we have to keep to benefit our clients in case we do make a mistake. Um, there are just a lot of things that that they don't understand that are that we have as overhead expenses, and they are also paying for our reputation. Um, if you have a good reputation in the community because you've been there for a long time, I think you'll find your case settles faster and that you do not have to use as many hours. A real problem that we're seeing are um, young lawyers coming out of law school, uh, in some cases owing up to $100,000 in student loans. Um, and from my perspective, um, I have to advise them that those student loans are non-dischargeable in a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. they, they will not go away for a full seven years. And so the, the salaries aren't what they were in the 80s, and yet they've got these tremendous loans. And what do they do? I mean, they're really crippled with some, some tremendous, tremendous debt. Just think of this, David. The average lawyer in the United States is making less, less a year than it costs for a Lexus. So people that are criticizing us are really not understanding the, the full impact of where that money goes. So what you're saying is the statistics are bearing out that uh, the average salary or the average compensation for lawyers is not as substantial as the public might perceive. That's absolutely Although true. Although I'm sure there's plenty of lawyers that are doing quite well. But right. that doesn't help them when they look at this 250 or $300 an hour that they might be quoted. Right. I mean, they still can't afford it. So the problem's still there, but it's not that lawyers are getting rich on this. Yeah, I think there definitely is a problem of people not feeling they have sufficient funds to go to lawyers to get their problems resolved and and that is a problem there's a I think only maybe 20 percent of people's legal needs are really met um, and so how are we going to address that and how are we going to help those people is, is definitely a problem we have to find a solution to legal fees for the middle class and that could be the topic of a whole nother discussion and panel because those that are needy certainly have uh, uh, the availability of your organization and many others just like yours. Uh, the well-to-do obviously can take care of their own legal fees, but the middle class is kind of stuck in between, and uh, I think that would make a very interesting uh, topic in the future. Well, we're just about out of time. So first of all, I want to thank our panelists for coming down here and, and spending uh, uh, this morning uh, working on this show and giving us some really good information. Uh, I hope that this show fosters a little bit better understanding in the community of how lawyers should relate to the community. I hope that some of our uh, viewers will be sitting at home in your easy chair saying, gee, I, I get it. I understand how that little piece fits into the overall puzzle. Uh, if that's the case, we've met our goal. If you have any letters or questions, if you want to be uh, a guest on a future show, give us a call at the Legal Forum or write us at the Legal Forum, care of the San Fernando Valley Bar Association, 5435 Balboa Boulevard, Encino, California, 91316 and look for the next show in the TV Guide. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching.